I must thank uh, Khaki for giving me this opportunity to uh, meet more people and um, whatever I've been trying to do for last five, six years through social media uh, to let more people know about uh, the fabulous uh, Odessa textile traditions. And uh, do you want me uh, to start away, uh, to start the presentation straight away? Or uh, would you like to ask me something before that? I'd certainly like to first ask you about your broadcasting background. Tell us a little bit about your prior journey and then we'll understand, you know, your present. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Uh, I grew up in a very small steel township called Bhilai. Bhilai. And uh, imagine an eight-year-old girl standing on a stool and listening to the radio, which was kept on the uppermost shelf. You know, those days, owning a radio was a big thing. And so we had a bush radio set, and it used to be kept on the topmost shelf. I would be standing there, and I would be listening to radio plays at that young age, which really used to fascinate me. It was not so much about film music, but uh, discussions, features, drama. Drama used to be my most favorite thing, you know. And I would often ask my father, he had introduced me to radio. I would often ask him that how can I become, you know, how can be on the other side of the radio and I could speak? So a time came when my parents started getting a little worried because rather than studying, I was forever listening to radio. Anyway, however, I uh, went to Delhi University to study with this passion for radio in me. There was no television then. Um, Doordarshan had just started one hour uh, transmission, which was black and white, and only Delhi television was there. My parents had planned, uh, you know, and sent me to Delhi to prepare for my civil services. But probably within a year's time, my teachers uh, somehow spotted some sort of talent. And uh, one of my professors called Dr. Indu Jain, she sent me to All India Radio and I started working for Yubani. Yubani is the source of all the top broadcasters in this country. So I started doing a few programs for Yubani. And uh, then in one of the debates in Miranda House, the first producer of Doordarshan, Kirti Jain, who was a judge and where I won a prize, she asked me to come for the audition because she thought I spoke very good Hindi. My parents always used to be worried because I loved Hindi so much that I used to neglect learning English and Madhya Pradesh, undivided Madhya Pradesh, where I grew up, was all about Hindi. There was this Hindi movement going on and, yes. and I just fell in love with the language, which is not my mother tongue. My mother tongue is Odia. We lived in Chhattisgarh. I never actually lived in Odisha. So uh, I went for the audition. I took some of my friends, like Vilnod Dua, Arun Singh, and all three of us made it. There used to be four programs. Uh, the music and dance program was done by Madhvi Mudgal. The rest of the programs we did. That's how my television journey began. And it really, really worried my parents. They had no clue what I was doing. Somebody would see some satellite programs which were shown in some community center in Bilai and go and tell my parents. So they, you know, let would come. They were very worried as to what I was doing, whether I was studying for my exams or not. Anyway, this sort of tussle with my parents went on until I finished my master's and uh, I stayed back. Uh, my hostel was gone. I stayed back with my uncle who was otherwise very fond of me, but he was also angry because I was forever out in Monday house. So anyway, I had to finally tell them that I am not writing civil services and uh, UPSC advertised for Indian Broadcasting Service. I wrote uh, that exam, I talked the list and I joined All India Radio. That is how my career began. And um, I, I loved being a public broadcaster because we had, uh, we had grown up in a country, um, in a city, in a township at a time when Things were very, very patriotic. My parents were also very patriotic. So uh, social development or social change, you know, bringing social change through broadcasting, through radio, through media 
was very challenging and very attractive for me. I felt so committed. I really felt committed. As a young broadcaster, I was in charge of women empowerment programs, uh, education, adult education. These were hardcore programs, which I thought I was, I was a very small, I was, my efforts were small, but I was also part of bringing in social change in this country. With that kind of commitment, we young programmers were working in All India Radio those days. And uh, of course, art, culture, music, drama, literature, all these programs were fun for me. And I was learning. I was learning whatever I learned in my textbook, classroom, in school or college was one part of it. And my entire informal uh, education happened through radio single-handedly. I learned about literature, drama, theater, social development, various things just listening to radio, just listening to radio. I wanted to give back. So my radio part of almost 20 years was very, very committed. In the meantime, black and white television uh, was growing and it, DD became very, very powerful. And 80s DD was um, the most powerful uh, media in this country. And uh, then I sh made a shift to Doordarshan. It's the same service. You could be posted anywhere. I made a shift to Doordarshan as a ADG, Additional Director General, to take care of the commercial broadcast and uh, the marketing. There was a very interesting shift in my career. I went for a Commonwealth Fellowship to UK, and I looked at the commercial broadcast, and I realized that anything is sellable. Why can't we sell our public service broadcast programs? Why can't we something like Satyamit Jayate be sold, you know, that, that kind of thing. And after I came back, I was forever lobbying, forever lobbying. And one of my CEO uh, noticed this and I was asked to set up the sales and marketing division of Doordarshan, which we did not have a tradition to sell directly. We used to employ third parties to sell our big properties. And then I never really looked back. We had cricket. I marketed cricket for four years. I have written about them. It was the most adventurous part of my career. And today, if somebody asks me that, what did I enjoy the most? I enjoyed my radio part very much. And then it was fascinating to discover that I, I loved sales and marketing. I was a born salesman and I sold anything and everything on DD besides big properties like um, cricket or feature film or serials. So that is, and then finally I became a director general and uh, I was always a communicator. Even, even when I was selling cricket or even when we were uh, selling something like sports, you know, I felt that we were communicating things. I used to be very particular about what kind of commercials we were placing in between uh, the most exciting uh, thing in India. So uh, this was my media career and I retired very satisfied. Doordarshan I know is no longer the same. All India Radio still is very huge and big with FM. But I have seen the best days of uh, DD and AIR. And I'm so proud to be a public broadcaster. It's a delightful journey. And yes, you're right. Uh, I, I think a lot of us have grown up only in the initial years on All India Radio and uh, later Doordarshan. And, you know, all our younger day learnings are uh, filled with, with those. The other channels uh, came much later. But what made you then in this, you know, how did you, along with this, get your passion to research fabric in sarees because you know that that's something that you picked up after your retirement i will take you back uh, to uh, the time when i was 16 and i landed up in delhi university i was a good student in school i was a rank holder in madhya pradesh board and imagine coming to a huge college like in the prastha college i completely felt i was lost i was lost and I was lost not because uh, of my intellectual abilities. You'll find it very funny that I was feeling lost because the kind of clothes I wore. For the first time, I realized how much the external appearance is also important. Till then, one never thought one was in school dress most of the time. I used to wear some churidar kurta or something. And my seniors during ragging immediately branded me as a bahenji. 
you know, and Delhi in 70s was, uh, I, I consider 70s very wild and very fascinating. I have seen through 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and now, but 70s were very interesting. I called it black and white because everything was black and white. The photographs were black and white. Television was black and white. And uh, uh, when I joined college, we had come out of uh, the Naxalite movement. I had friends in hostel who were forcefully uh, uh, sent by their parents because they were involved somebody's boyfriend was either shot dead or somebody's boyfriend was rotting in the jail. So, and on the other hand, you know, there were Beatles, uh, there was George Harrison, my brother joined St. Stephen's in a year's time here, long hair wanting to look like George Harrison. So it was very dynamic time. And we had a women prime minister who had just won Bangladesh war. Most of girls were looking up to her and she wore sari, you know. She was like our sari icon those days. Uh, so I was struggling with my identity and I noticed uh, Mrs. Gandhi was, um, you know, invited to our college. She looked so smart in a sari. She was wearing an orange sari, I remember. Then uh, our college president, she wouldn't even know, I wonder where she is, a girl called Yuna Baljit Singh, she used to wear saris. Though most of the girls were very smartly dressed in parallels, bell bottoms, and I knew that I couldn't make a switch to that. It was just not me, you know, I couldn't have done that coming from a small town. So I noticed that they were wearing saris and they looked very smart. My mother always wore saris. So after three months, when I went back, I asked my mother to lend me seven saris. There were seven days. I said, I'll manage with seven saris and seven blouses. My mother wore unmatched blouses, mostly cheat. I think those unmatched blouses were very sustainable because you could just wear it with any sari. You didn't have hundreds of blouses. She never wore rubia blouses. And in fact, I used to go to my friend's houses, see their mother in matching blouses. I would come back and ask her, why don't you wear matching blouses? Then she told me she particularly wore chintz as a commitment to Swadeshi. She came from a family of freedom fighters. She said chintz, she told, she's the one who told me the chintz story, how it was banned and how many women of her time, especially in Eastern India and in Southern India took to chint. So I came back to hostel with unmatched blouses, sari, and I started wearing them. And um, I, I used to go for debates. There was a sudden interest in me when I started wearing saris. People started noticing me. Uh, to cut it short, sari gave me an identity. Sari gave me back my confidence that I had in college. So I never gave up sari. I uh, handloom saris. I knew they were handloom saris because my mother used to talk about them, but I didn't know so much about it. Then. Um, our teachers, some of our teachers wore sarees. And then I have learned mostly, I'm not a textile um, ex expert in the sense that I haven't gone to a design school or I haven't studied uh, handloom, but I have learned uh, from people around me, the finer things. Every time I bought a saree, I would ask the weaver or the salesman um, about the, the basic feature of uh, the saree. And being a broadcaster, the first thing that we were taught that we must know a little bit about everything around us. Tomorrow, I maybe need to, uh, uh, you know, do a program on uh, Indian roadways or Indian railways or or the people cutting trees in this country. It could be just anything. It could be handloom. So this habit was cultivated in us by our bosses that we must always ask questions and know a little bit about it. Rest, the experts will talk. If I'm the interviewer, I would need to ask few questions. So to ask few questions, I must need to know. So probably because of that, I had been asking people whenever I bought a sari, and very diligently I built my collection with whatever little money I was earning initially as a compare when I started working. Uh, I would save money for two, three months and go and buy sarees. Then I was also fortunate to uh, work with people like uh, Kapila Vasa and Usha Malik. I was in ICCR for two years. 
and then I came to All India Radio, where women were very well dressed, well dressed in true sense. They wore handloom, so I kept learning from people around me, and that is how I developed an interest while I was collecting my sarees. But trust me, I really didn't know that I I had these valuable informations with my with me and in my head, and it was all there. So after I retired. Before I retired, I think just one month or so, somebody added me to a sari group. And uh, when I saw what people were posting, they were just posting pictures of themselves. So I thought, mm, I'm not a young girl to be uh, posting just my pictures. Why don't I write about what I wear? I had just done an archival recording of some 15 hours archival recording with Dr. Kapilaj. And there was a picture where I was wearing an Orissa sari, I think, and she was wearing some 80 year old sari of her mother. And she told me the story of it. She said, I have worn it for you because I've been noticing you wear good saris. So there was an interesting story around that. I wrote about Kapilaji, I wrote about Indian Andum, I wrote about that particular sari. That was my first post, you know, uh, because I was very gungo about recording Kapila Vasan for 15 hours, you know, those days. I hadn't retired it. So that's how it started. And then soon after that, I retired. And, um, you know, the people, the admin of that particular group, two girls who are from Odessa, Sushmita uh, and her sister, they wanted to do an interview with me. They, she came home, she did an interview and I thought, okay, fine, there's some interview which will appear somewhere. She, uh, the headline of that interview was something, some icon, sari icon or something and it was a very nicely written proper interview about me, my work, and how I have collected sarees, I was very surprised, you know, if you probably check in the net, along with some very important interviews of mine about my media career, that also pops up somewhere. So I thought, I felt very responsible. I really thought that I couldn't be writing frivolous posts. I must take it seriously. And I started writing a post every day about what I was wearing with all seriousness. There was nothing frivolous about it. And then my children who used to be a little apprehensive in the beginning that what am I doing? Why am I getting so many pictures clicked? Where, where are these pictures going? They couldn't see uh, those sari groups. So then finally uh, they said, okay, since you are so keen on it, why don't you start an Instagram page? That's how you can curate it your way and uh, whatever frivolous in the sari groups, you can avoid it. So I started my Instagram journey and it's been uh, since I think 2016 or 17. And every post on Instagram, I have written with some purpose, with some commitment, uh, not only sari posts, but post about women empowerment, post about family values. Sari is always there at the center of all my stories. But there are many more stories, you know, beyond saris, which I like to write and, and tell people that it's I'm not here just to post my saris as some costume. You know, saris are linked to your life. There is a life going on with saris. And with your ideology, with your commitment, with your uh, thinking, you buy your saris, you collect your saris. Everybody's collection cannot be the same. Everybody's taste cannot be the same. What you wear reflects what you are. So that's what I'm trying to drive it. In the bargain, the viewers also benefit. See, I'm not a seller to really, really benefit viewers. But when I write about a sari, people learn about it. People look for those saris, people buy. I don't do any commercial collaborations. I've stayed away from it. I keep getting requests, but I have purposely stayed away from it because it just doesn't match my, my past uh, work, you know, as Director General of Guru Session. I, I write it because I love it. Another thing that benefited me from it is writing every day. It has brought discipline into my life and I think it keeps me young. And that's how my sari journey, uh, you know, this writing about saris began. Wonderful. So I think the time is right now for us to say, take a deep dive into the Oriya part of this. You initially said that uh, 
you never lived there. Uh, so uh, I'm, you know, very keen and I'm sure everyone else is to find out, uh, you know, tell us about ODI designs. And I, I believe you have a presentation. So yes. maybe you take us I, I will that. do that. It will take two minutes to load uh, and uh, come to that. I'll keep talking uh, yes. about it. This, this presentation that I'm going to make is not a mere presentation. It's actually my journey of uh, learning about uh, my own state. I lived in Chhattisgarh, so I didn't live in Odessa. Uh, but so I had to discover my state. My parents were uh, very Odia. We ate Odia food, you know, for them time had frozen. So our mm. house was a mini Odessa. We ate Odia food, they wore um, Odia, uh, textile, my mother, my grandmother, my bua, everybody always, every day wore Uriya textile. Um, on, on the walls, my father had with great pride put up pictures of Indrani Rahman and Sanjukta Panigrahi. Um, he would tell us stories about Jagannath. So until I was with them, until I left for college, uh, I had heard a lot about Odessa. And then when I started buying sarees, through the sarees, I discovered my own state, you know, while buying, talking to weavers, talking to salesmen. There was a shop called Utkalika in Emporia Complex. I used to go yes. there and learn. So this is my journey, actually. Talking about weaves is actually my personal journey. It's, it's not only my love for sarees. It's how I learned and relearned to love my own state through the textile of Odessa. As you also said in the beginning, Odessa is not only uh, rich in dance, music, uh, literature, culture, temple art, all kinds of things, but Odessa is also rich in textile because textile has everything in it. The the temple art, the daily life, the chitta art, the tribal art, uh, the, the literature, the poetry of uh, uh, Jayadev, uh, Jagannath, everything is reflected through the sarees. It is the entire culture of Purissa culminates in its textile. I will uh, you know, tell you uh, through my presentation how, why and how it is so, you know, I find it so fascinating, the Odessa weaves. This is, uh, this is the current Odessa, which got its status. You can see in red color on the eastern part of India, this exists. In 1936, uh, 1st April, the state was created after being fragmented and segmented for almost about 300 years, sometimes also merged with a uh, uh, neighboring states. Many would remember uh, the reference to Anga Banga Kalinga, that was Bihar, Odisha, and uh, Bengal, which were together at one point of time. And uh, uh, but the Odias, this is the state I wanted to show you because even now, not many people know where exactly Odisha is. Sometimes when they ask me, "Where are you from?" And I used to say I'm from Odessa. They would wonder where exactly is Odessa. That is, that's a bit sad. But therefore, I thought that let me, whoever is watching this show, let me see where exactly is Odessa. Odessa was also close to Bengal. Bengal, the Renesa happened in Bengal. So Odessa was a little overshadowed always, you know. Uh, and not many people knew about. People know very little about Odessa and its culture. But the most interesting part is the people living in Odessa associate themselves more with Kalinga. The geographical extent of Kalinga was from the mouth of Ganges to the uh, Krishna. You know, it was a huge uh, geographical area that came under as Kalinga. Kalinga was the mighty maritime power of let's say the history of Kalinga goes back to probably 8th century. That's how old, that's how seeped in antiquity is Kalinga. And because of its 
rich maritime uh, you know traditions uh, the the merchants the traders who were known as sadhava poor you see right in the middle a potter chitra which depicts when they set out for sale and how people were you know uh, sending them away uh, so they the trade was mainly with i won't go too much into detail but trade was mainly with southeast asian countries and um, there was a lot of cultural exchange with these countries. Um, Uriyas love to say that the double ikat and the ikat went to Indonesia uh, from Odessa, but I would not claim that since there are no proofs. But definitely there was such a wonderful trade, you know, with these people that either it came from there or you it went from there. Um, the, you know, the textile which was imported exported from India at that point of time was known as Kalinga Vastra. Not, not only uh, in many texts, Kalingam, Kalingam is a South Indian, uh, is a Tamil word and it was called Kalingam Vastra. It is mentioned in Buddhist text, in Jain text, in, uh, in various other texts that the textile that went from India, especially by Pandya, kings who sent it to Egypt, uh, to various other countries, was known as Kalingam Vastra. In fact, the, the Indian Ocean, the Bay of Bengal, the Indian Ocean was known as Kalinga Sea also. That in, Kalinga was a mighty power and with this cultural exchange, the people of Kalinga were proud people. Their trade and their, um, you know, made them a rich state. Um, uh, and uh, they were proud of their culture. And when the state was formed, things became a little more organized for them after 1936. And I would be uh, talking. Lovely. We have you and your presentation back here with us. Okay. So I'm back. I'll go back to this. And I'm talking about the influences. Okay. I'm sorry, but these technical things happen. Suddenly, my uh, hotspot had disappeared, had disconnected. So, um, I'm talking about the influences because these influences are there on all the weaves in different clusters, though the technique of weave may be different. There are two main techniques in Odessa. One is Bandhakala, that is the ikat, which is tie and dye, and the other is uh, the, you know, the extra web, the third uh, thread, which is used like an embroidery thread. I'll come to that and explain them. But the most important influence in all Odessa textile is Lord Jagannath. Lord Jagannath is, uh, you know, their friend, their sakha their God, everything. He is part of their entire life, you know. And the weaver, uh, most of the weavers who may not be highly educated, they know, uh, they know by heart entire Geet Govind of Jayadev. When they weave, they use the colors of Jagannath, red, black, uh, white, yellow. These are the three, three colors which they use. You can see uh, on the right, uh, the Rath, Rath Yatra, the three Raths have the same color. Jagannath wears, uh, Jagannath, Balabhadra and Subhadra, they wear the same sort of saris, um, three of them. Uh, and also, interestingly, uh, Jagannath is like any one of us. He's incomplete. If you see them, they do not have hands. If they have hands, they do not have fingers. They do not have feet. They are tribal gods. They are the only god who come out every year to meet their, uh, come out of their temple. No other temple, uh, the main deities ever come out onto the road, but they come out for Rath Yatra. So Jagannath is all pervasive. So the influence of Jagannath on all our textile is huge, you know, it's at the core of everything. The next uh, influence are the temple art. Odessa is a land of temples. 
There is Konark, Sun Temple Konark influences most of the things, the work done on its walls. Then there is Puri Temple, Jagannath Temple, um, whatever you see on the wall. So what, it's very syncretic, you know. Uh, whatever was carved on the walls of these temples uh, by the artists were what they used to see around them in the nature, in the earth, sea, sky, stars, animals, whatever was around them they saw, they carved it on these temples. Konark is a 13th century temple. Puri is around the same time, 12th century temple. So whatever was there came, the, my next slide will show you. I'll come back to uh, this slide. Uh, you know, the women, whatever they saw on the temples, they started drawing art on the floor and on the walls of their houses, on the floor and walls. And when he started weaving, he probably recreated uh, the same design. Do you see the, what you see in white, that is the floor art. What you see on red sari, blue sari, they're all uh, weaves, but they are, um, they just like, they're drawn like the way the women draw it. Even if an elephant or a tiger is woven on the sari, they don't make it, uh, they make it the way the women draw it. It is very curvilinear. I'll come to curvilinear Ikata later. I want to take you back to this slide. Uh, you see the dancers, you see Konark temple, you see uh, the, the lion and, yeah. and the elephant of Konark. It's all woven into the saris. The Konark chakra on top and see that yellow sari are uh, woven into the sari. Very fine. The Orissa Ikat is very, very fine as if they're drawn by the zero brush, you know. But the temple art reflects on the saris. Temple art reflects on the floor art and then it goes on to the saris. So therefore, I like to call Orissa Weave very syncretic very syncretic because art just does not die. It continues. The motifs don't die. The motifs just continue from temple to flows to, to Patachitra, from Patachitra to saris. And uh, so it, and sari keeps them alive. Sari really, really keeps them alive. These are the other thing, are the tribal influences. The tribal paintings on the walls, they look you can see on the left side, many of the wall art of Saura tribes. Saura wall paintings are the most popular paintings which go on to the saris. There is a lot of other tribal influences. Uh, there are many tribal weaves like Habaspuri and uh, many other weaves which I'll come to when I start talking cluster rise. Besides this syncretic uh, influence of the existing art, temple art, wall art, and Potter Chitra and other forms of art, there is also influence, the, the Odessa weavers are quite influenced by nature, uh, what they see around them. So sea, earth, sky, nature, wildlife, find big expression in their saris. There's a particular sari I have shown where uh, it's almost like uh, the entire jungle being, it's like a print they take from their nature, the peacocks, the turtles, the fish is the most popular motive in Odessa saris. We eat fish, um, we, we love fish. Fish is there in all our art. Then Shank Chakra Gada Padma of Jagannath is always there in most of the saris. I'm trying to, because whatever time we have lost, you know, I'm trying to gain that. And with all these influences, there are two kinds of technique. One is Ikat, which is tie and dye, called in Odessa as Bandho. And the other is extra web. First, I will talk about Ikat. This slide shows you different clusters where Ikat is woven. Uh, one is Sambalpur, which has the finest of the Ikat. The other is the oldest, and the style of Ikat is very different from Sambalpur. Then we have Jagatsingpur and Jagatsingpur in the Eastern Odisha, and Pitala in the Southern Odisha, which are called Sutaluga. They are very affordable. They come within a thousand rupees even today, and they have minimalistic ikat work in them. And most of the Odisha wears them at home. You know that is why still the mill-made uh, sarees have not made inroads into Odisha, though they have started 
making uh, Odessa designs in print. There are about three lakhs weavers in Surat from Ganjam. And you will be surprised to see, I wish I had taken some of those prints. Those prints from far look like Orissa Ikat, look like Orissa Bonkai, but still people are managing with their Suta Luga. I'm coming to Sambalpuri Bandha or Sambalpuri Ikat, which is the finest. And by looking at Orissa Ikat, if you are fond of Ikat from other states of India, Ikat is woven uh, in Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, and Tamil Nadu. I am fond of Ikat. I am fond of all of them. I will just draw comparison. I'm not going to say which is the best Ikat because people have different uh, choices, you know. I love Urissa Ikat because of its curvilinear uh, way of weaving. Curvilinear is, can you see the rounded edges? The Odessa Ikat is very different from Jose because there is no outside influence on Odessa Ikat. Odessa Ikat, um, Odessa was fairly isolated. On the western side, there were hills. On the eastern side, there was Bay of Bengal. So uh, they weren't invaders invading Odessa as often as North India was invaded. So there wasn't any Mughal uh, influence on the motifs. The motifs are very local. This is the most important thing to remember that the motifs of Orissa are very, very local. What the weavers see in and around them, they try to weave them. So Sambalpur cluster developed 400 years ago and it is believed that the king uh, of uh, Sonpur who was looking up it is today in Chhattisgarh, but Raipur was part of Kalinga. From Raipur, 100 weavers were taken to Sonpur, and uh, they were Ikat weavers, and they were patronized, and they started weaving uh, cotton sarees. Sambalpur was known for its fine cotton, and this is what was Kalinga Vastra. The Kalingam, or the Kalingam Vastra, was, this is what it was, uh, which was being exported all over the world. And uh, you can see that there are various motifs besides curvilinear ikat. Uh, you, um, the curvilinear, the example of curvilinear ikat is the blue uh, two peacocks. You can see how finely they are woven, as if they are painted. And uh, sarees have names in Odessa. All the weavers always give a name to sarees, most of the sarees. So many colors and getting such accurate motif is very tough in tie-dye method, in ikat uh, method or bandha method. Then on the right side, you see a sari called Bichitrapuri, which is a chess-like design, a very popular design, which remains contemporary at all time. Until 80 in Sambalpur, uh, only cottons were woven. Then there was uh, an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur called Krutarth Acharya, who, uh, who was more of, he set up a cooperative society. He knew that weavers can't go and sell their product directly. Prior to that, weavers were going and selling their products and probably not making so much of money. He found the market for them. He set up Sambalpuri Bastrale. He sometimes gave them designs. He suggested them colors. He introduced also the chemical because I had only vegetable dyes. The Kalinga Vastram were made with vegetable dyes, but all these sarees that you see on this page, most of them are with chemical dyes. And he's the one who introduced the most popular Vichitrapuri with red and black uh, checks. Um, and uh, he introduced silk. Silk came as late as 80s to uh, Sambalpur. And then they have not looked back. They have used the best uh, mulberry silk and finest motifs. So, the, the red saree that you see I think I'm wearing the same sari. It has uh, Posapoli, the Vichitrapuri sari, the checks, the chessboard like checks in general in Odessa sari. Modern thing, let us say uh, early, uh, early uh, 70s or mid 70s, these designs came because my oldest uh, Vichitrapuri was bought when I was still in college, this Bagambari. Uh, these, these are from my collection. I haven't taken pictures from uh, net or anywhere. 
this collection I built over here. Some sarees are my mother's, which are more than 52 years old. Bagambari is 52 years old. My Pasapalli is almost 50 years old. And this, this is what is Sambalpuri. And uh, why do we call it Bandha? Because the word Bandha, Bandhna, is what is tie and die. And also interesting story is there was a poet called Upendra Bhanj uh, who wrote poems in circuit. They were like circuits. They were called and they were love poems gifted to the bride when the wedding took place. So uh, the weavers love Upendra Bhanja's uh, poetry. They often sing it and uh, they named their uh, uh, tie and die, the bandha were as bandha sadis. So in Odia, it is called bandha. Uh, we don't use the word ikat at all. We call it bandha. The weavers call it bandha. So Sambalpur, though uh, a cluster which came later than um, Nuapatna, weaves the finest ikat today, the curvilinear ikat today, which is different from the geometrical ikat of Gujarat and Pochampalli. The oldest, uh, almost 800 years, uh, uh, you know, 12th century uh, old uh, cluster is Noapatna. There is an interesting story how the Noapatna weavers started weaving saris, the fine saris. On the left side, you see the picture of poet Jayadev, who used to be, who is to live literally in Jagannath temple. He worshipped Lord Jagannath and he wrote Geet Govind while he lived in Puri. Every day he used to write one verse and um, gift it to Lord Jagannath. So he was thinking once that how can I be closer to Lord? So he said if somebody can weave it onto his Angavastra, then he'll wear it on his neck and I'll be the closest to him. So from his uh, village, Kenduli, he got one set woven, one verse of um, uh, Geet Govin. He got it woven and gifted to the god. The king was fairly impressed, Ramchandra Dev II. And you find, uh, you find this description uh, by, uh, this has been written by Sadashiv Das Rath, who is a historian. He found it in the daily diary of the king. Ram Chandra Dev. So this is um, this is written. This is noted. It's not a just a story. So Ram Chandra Dev was so in, impressed by this. So he asked the Nuapatna weavers. He ordered them to weave uh, angavastra, which to be given to the god almost every day. So they started weaving on the left side. Um, this red. I have a sari in which Geet Govind is woven which I have bought just to preserve. The interesting part of it is, and, and there is a huge demand for these written saris, these scripted saris today. Uh, I have seen some scripted saris with Hanuman Chalisa on it, uh, with um, Tulsi Ramayan on it, which they are weaving beautifully. But women in Odisha do not wear scripted saris. They think not only this is Geet Govind related to Jagannath, but also scripts are representation of Saraswati. So Ma Saraswati couldn't be touching the feet, you know. So they do not wear the scripted sari. So the most uh, amazing thing about Mahapatna is uh, the scripted sari. And the cluster grew after that. And they started uh, weaving you know, whatever you see in Sambalpuri sari in a finer way. You find the same motifs, similar, same nature uh, influence motifs, Jagannath influence motifs, uh, daily life influence motifs, Chitta motifs. You find in Nuapatna too. Uh, the pink sari depicts the harvest. It is called Dhanapatri sari. Every sari has a name, as I told you. Uh, on the right, there is a sari called Tarabali. You know, uh, we often talk about Ajrak and its relationship with cosmos and how it is uh, you know, uh, depicted in Alhambra tiles and uh, rich traditions of Ajrak prints uh, connecting it to cosmos. But the Uriya weavers had their own ways of uh, 
uh, making the stars and the sky. This is one of the sarees, one of the oldest design. My sari, this is my sari which my mother gave me when I was in college in 1970. So more than 50 year old sari. I still have it. Uh, the design had become almost extinct. Uh, but uh, when I, I saw the book, there's a book by B.C. Mahanti on Odisha textile. This is the only uh, good book written many years back. I just chanced upon it in Weaver Service Center and I found a piece of the same color sari in that book. I said, oh my God, I have this sari. And I sat there with permission of the head of Weaver Service Center and I read about how the weavers of Odisha have depicted sky and the cosmos and the stars in many designs. There is a sari called Nakshatra Bhusan. There is a sari called Asman Tara. Many have become extinct. Even this was not being woven. So when I wore and I posted it, many weavers in Nwapatna have revived it. They have tried to create this color. I also bought a new one, but the color is not the same, but they have done a good job. And this sari has become very popular. I wish somebody also weaves Asmantara. The rumals are there with Asmantara. Uh, there is a sari called Nakshatra Bhushan. These saris have to be revived all over again. So this is Odisha weaver's way of weaving the cosmos. Um, and uh, the, there is a uh, uh, green sari again, which has many motifs. It is called Nova Koti. There are nine motifs woven in each box. Koti is a box. The interesting thing is no adjacent motif is similar to the previous one. It is pure mathematics. Odessa Ikat is pure, pure mathematics. I was surprised to know when I was talking to a weaver, I was getting a sari made. I asked him, will you give me a graph or a picture or something? He said, no, there is no graph. It's all in my mind. There there is uh, nothing on paper. I said, how will you do it? He said, no, Jagannath will do it. Then he told me, he said, I pray to Jagannath before I start weaving. Design is in my mind. When we are making the tie and dye threads, whatever is done in our mind, accordingly, uh, with some precision, we tie and dye. So imagine tying and dyeing the web thread before weaving, and then when you weave, the design falls into place without any graph. That is how oh. it's so wondrous about the Noapatna Ikat and the Sambalpur Ikat. Noapatna today is a big center uh, for, uh, uh, you know, making bandha threads for many other clusters where they don't know how to make bandha, but they weave their own... Uh, threads, whatever they use, tusser or cotton, and take these uh, things and they uh, include these bandha threads. So you find bandha sarees in many, many other clusters also. Two clusters that uh, I had talked about right in the beginning, Jagat Singhpur and Pitala. There's an interesting story again. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was taking his long religious journey from Nadia to Puri, some weavers came with him as part of his, uh, as his followers. And they settled in different parts of Odisha. Some settled in Gopalpur. I'll come to Gopalpur later. Some settled in Jagasinpur. Jagasinpur is my village from where I come from. We still have our ancestral house there. So Jagasinpur sarees are, I really love them. I have not made a separate slide on it. Uh, they are simple sarees. Still, uh, they start from 250 rupees to 1000 rupees. Their border is ikat, their pallus are ikat. They are called suttaluka, cotton sari, suttaluka. So those weavers who stayed back and lived in Odessa, they started weaving saris like tant. It's single count sari. It looks like tant, very fine. 120 count uh, thread they use, but single count. The, 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 the threads are not thick. And uh, they make uh, ikat borders, and uh, but they have tant like extra extra wet small designs in those sarees. You know how it's so old. It is let's say twelfth uh, century old story. You know Chaitanya Mahaprabhu going all the way to Puri and some people staying back. Same uh, same way in Pitala in Barampur, 
Also, these simple sarees are woven. I have written a lot about these sarees because I think they are treasure. If you can get a thicker saree for thousand rupees, it is a treasure. Sometimes now viewers of Jagatsinpur and Pitala take the ikat bandha threads from Nuapatna and they include it into their single count cotton and they weave their simpler sarees. So that was about ikat. Now we come to most of the weaves that I'm going to talk. Uh, they use the extra weft technique, which is as old as ikat in Orissa and very fine work is being done in Orissa with these uh, techniques. So uh, on the left side, you see Ganjam Bomkai. Ganjam Bomkai is a 40 count, very coarse cotton sari, which was being woven in Ganja uh, by very few families. And uh, look at the bird woven in it. They, the motifs are same old motifs, but they are so contemporary looking. There are birds, there are lampshades uh, in the sari, and this you can see the lampshade on the left of it. This is this extra web is special because it is woven through jala technique. Uh, it is not woven through jala technique, whereas most of the bonkai sarees are woven through jala technique. This is literally hand woven like embroidery. You have weft and walk. Then the third thread comes with a long, uh, you know, uh, wooden stick, which they call dangi. And with that, like a needle, they lift the thread and then they weave it like a, do it like an embroidery. All this, these patterns that you see on Bonkai are literally hand done like embroidery. This extra web is literally, this whole sari is completely handmade. So uh, this sari had become almost extinct. Uh, and uh, during uh, you know, Vishwakarma exhibition, Matan Singh, with the help of Viewer Service Center Bhuvaneshwar, got it rewoven by Kaviraj Nayak's father. Kaviraj Nayak, until last year, was the only weaver who used to weave it along with his family and his relatives. That was the only family which was weaving. Unfortunately, we lost him in an accident. My sari is woven by Kaviraj Nayak. So this sari was woven during Vishwakarma exhibition, revived uh, with the efforts of Martin Singh, was gifted to Mrs. Gandhi, a copy of uh, another piece of that sari is preserved in Viva Service Center in Bhuvaneshwar. So this is, uh, it's a GI tag weave. This is Ganjam Bomkai. But what is popularly known as Bomkai, which most of the people in India, women have and wear, is not from Southern Orissa, but from Western Orissa, from Sonpur. On the right side, you know, there are little maps which I have uh, given, uh, they are hand-drawn, but I have shown the clusters. Ganjam is in the southern part of Purissa, you can see, and uh, Sonpur is on the western side in the same zone where Sambalpur is. In the same, it is undivided Sambalpur, Sonpur is there. Most of the Ikat sarees are also woven in Sonpur. Sonpur is a very, very rich cluster today. And uh, the, the king, the same king, uh, Ramaydev, um, took weavers from uh, Bonkai and patronized them in Sonpur and encouraged them to be extra web sarees. Now the Sonpur weavers, even though they had got the technique with them, they ended up weaving something very different. On the right side, you see all my uh, Sonpur uh, Bonkais. They were quite influenced by Baluchari saris. They were really influenced by Baluchari saris. And if you see, even though the motifs are chitta motifs, they are inspired by chitta motifs, but the layout of the saris is quite like Baluchari saris. But the motifs are very different from Baluchari saris. The Odia weavers remain completely untouched as far as the motifs are concerned. You see the, the 
trumpet blowing women they are from konark temple uh, and the red sari on the right hand uh, has all chitta motifs uh, the pink sari on the right hand little bit of what i can see has the lotus and that is woven with jala technique these are all woven with jala technique from in which the extra web thread comes from the top and we were use it in ganjam bomkai extra web thread comes from the side with a needle like uh, wooden piece called dangi so bomkai is again a very precious weave last year finance minister wore a bomkai and much was talked about it during budget she also wore a bomkai which also had ikat so now with experiments because sonpur is the same place where ikat is also uh, woven in nearby areas in bargad in barpali so bargad is is the best center for ikat and barpali sonpur all our neighboring you know districts so they have now started making sarees where the inclusion of ikat also comes is this i can't uh, it's not visible in that uh, red picture that i have put uh, it has beautiful ikat as well as extra web so today it is very difficult to say but looking at the whole body when you call something bomkai the whole body is with the extra web the pallu may have a bit of ikat in it so that's how you can differentiate people who are learning about it they often ask me how do we say which is ikat which is bomkai so like this is ikat this is what i am wearing is ikat double ikat this is double ikat and the ikat sarees of odisha have another feature they have woven dobi borders you know either hand woven or through dobi this gives the weight to the saree as compared to uh, the patola of gujarat and the pochampalli sarees these borders are very special either you find rudraksh or you find uh, fish in it or a combination of rudraksh and fish and now people have also started weaving uh, turtles in in the in the borders which i find very very endearing and they remind me of ridley turtles of uh, chilika you know so we'll move now from bomkai to the next uh, cluster uh, this is gopalputta sir these days this weave is my most favorite weave because they are doing such excellent work you know each weaver there is doing such excellent work gopalpur tasar has gi tag but uh, let's not be misled uh, uh, thinking that it is for tasar it is not for tasar in fact uh, um, gopalpur does not produce tasar women only um, you know uh, use the tasar which is given to them by serifet and uh, serifet is the body which procures tasar which is uh, cultivated in mayurbhanj and uh, nearby areas of mayurbhanj and the tasar is given to them sometimes that is also not uh, enough for them they take buy also tasar from chatisgarh which produces enough of tasar um, you know chatisgarh tasar probably in quality also the best tasar so uh, gopalpur also has an interesting story gopalpur is also connected to uh, chaitanya mahaprabhu so when he took his long journey from nadia and but most of the people who joined him in this journey from nadia to puri they were from uh, either nadia or from bardhaman most of them were from bardhaman uh, from the community of guin and gods you still find these surnames in gopalpur uh, i know many viewers who are guin and god there are also das and other surname so they stayed on they used to weave tant like sarees in very fine cotton with booties until 1972 then cotton started becoming little more expensive also in the meantime the super cyclone happened when the super cyclone happened uh, suki all the imagine all their looms got destroyed the, the cluster was completely ruined but thankfully the government uh, stepped in government uh, provided them loans and government introduced them to tasar which used to be much cheaper those days than cotton and uh, more at that point of time most of the tasar was procured from chatisgarh because uh, they had not started cultivating in mayurbhanj those days 
and also Martin Singh uh, did a project called Kalinga Vastra project in Gopalpur. He taught them how to make Pura Kumbha. Now, do you see on the right side a yellow sari with very sharp piercing temple? This is the minimalistic ikat they know how to weave. They don't know how to weave ikat, but this much was taught to them. And this is a three shuttle weave. Generally, saris are woven with two shuttles, but this is a three shuttle weave. What in South, in Kanjivaram and other saris, people refer to as Korvai, uh, this is exactly that. With the third shuttle, two shuttles are used for both side border, and with one shuttle, the body of the sari is woven. So, using the interlocking method, these piercing kumbhas are woven. In fact, um, you know, I uh, had a colleague uh, who once was uh, posted in Myanmar. She she asked me in one of the meetings. She said, "Would you know um, why the kumbhas are so so sharp? Which where did the influence come? Not from your Puri temple and Konak temple because their spires are not as sharp." You know, there are these Bagan temples in Myanmar and their spires are so sharp. So this is again, the Sadhavapurs, the merchants who went uh, to these countries, with them, they brought back these uh, technology, these ideas, and probably the Kumbha came from Burma, came from there, you know, so uh, from those Bagan temples. Um, so, Foda Kumbha is one of the, the sharp temples. Foda Kumbha in English translates sharp temples. These sharp temples are uh, used or the technology is known only in Gopalpur uh, and Sambalpur. Um, the people, uh, the weavers in Vapatna don't use it uh, much and they don't, they've lost the technique in fact and Kotpat Saris and Barampuri Saris. I'll come to those and talk. This is a very special technology. And also, they use jala. It's all handmade. They use jala technique. And uh, they also use a technique called chiari, which is the tapestry weave. Can you see the Konak temple in that sari? It, it is a sari which I got woven from an excellent weaver called Srikant Das. I had an old sari with me, which had Konak temple in a Bonkai sari. I had some pictures and I requested him to put the Konak temple and that Gajar Singha motif. Gajar Singha is the, is the lion and the elephant from Konak. Gajar Singha motif is his creation. Uh, I can take no credit for it. Konak is, everything is his creation. I just did a pencil drawing, which is not I can't say I designed this sari. I only conceived the idea because he had to make the graph. I told him to weave Konak temple, um, uh, the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uske konak ke chakke, the wheels, the wheels of Konak temple, the turtles and the fish. He executed the design so beautifully and the temple, he is the only weaver there who makes tapestry weave. The tapestry weave, actually is done in Dharapathar cluster. I'll go to that later. So, uh, and do you see the fish motifs? Actually, my interpretation is, now everybody writes that once I wrote, the fish of Gopalpur is not like the fish done in other saris of Bonkai and, uh, and Sambalpuri. They are more of fish bones. You know, I, I used to see small fish, dead fish, their bones lying when I used to visit my village near the pond. So this is more like fish bone. So these fish bone patterns of Gopalpur are very distinct, very distinct. You won't find them in Bonkai, you won't find them anywhere. So Pudakumba, fish bone, chiari weave, and they have also started now including ikat, but they don't know how to make ikat. They get, do you see the black, the gray sari at the bottom? They get their threads uh, tied and dyed in Nwapatna. And then uh, they weave the saris. They don't make the sari. This got its GI tag pretty late, but it got its GI tag. And the GI tag is for their fine 
weaving technique and not for tasar. This is a coat put sari, uh, one of the most popular saris today. Though in Orissa, uh, people didn't wear it much because it was very thick. It was very thick and uh, the aristocracy in Orissa uh, was aspirational. They loved, uh, they loved uh, Banarsis, they loved Baluchidis, and they loved their uh, Sonpuri. And when it came to cotton, they wore their own cotton and tant. So these sarees were very thick. And originally, they were draped by tribals. They were three and a half meter sarees. They were less in width. And the tribals used to wear them. I want to uh, correct one myth. All these sarees are sold as woven by tribals. Uh, they are not uh, woven by tribals. No sari in Odessa is woven by tribals. They are woven by weaver communities. There are various communities. This is woven by Mirigan uh, community, uh, which is a weaver's community. The weaver's community used to weave it. Uh, whether uh, the aristocrats wore it or the tribals wore it in earlier days, the tribal never really wore their sarees. The Patras communities are from um, uh, Nuapatna. The Bhulia and Mehers are weavers from Sambalpur. So there is a weaver community all over in all clusters in Odessa who weave these sarees. This is one cluster where they completely use uh, natural dye. This sari is so, the saris and stoles are so appreciated today because uh, they are natural dyes. They get it from an owl tree called owl tree, uh, which is available in plenty. Its barks, uh, its roots are all used to get uh, these colors. Um, these saris are also woven in the border state of Chhattisgarh in Jagdalpur and Bastar. Because the, those Mirigan community, they also live. Because these states were, at one point of time, same single state. Only the boundaries have been drawn. So you'll also find them in Chhattisgarh. But they are known as uh, Kotpat. And known by the Kotpat village, uh, they have uh, GI tag. And they're very precious sarees because they are natural dyed sarees. I only wish uh, they, they will use little uh, finer threads, you know, but I suppose people appreciate it because they are very coarse and they are thick and people just love it for that. Uh, another weave, which goes by the name of uh, tribal weave, uh, again, not really tribal, I would say, uh, they were weavers of Habaspur. Uh, Habaspur uh, is in Kalahandi. It's Kalahandi, uh, life is very challenging in Kalahandi today because of starvation deaths, because of repeated droughts. Kalahandi at one point of time was a prosperous state of Odessa. The name itself, and very rich in art and craft. Kalahandi means Kala, is art and craft, handi is pot. It, the state name meant pot of pot full of art and craft. But sadly, uh, with the changing climate and everything, such repeated droughts uh, invaded this uh, particular state that there is something called Kalahandi syndrome. Uh, it's known as Kalahandi syndrome. And uh, people became so poor that they, most of these people who were weaving this particular sari, they migrated to Chhattisgarh. I have seen in Bhilai, where I lived, most of the rickshaw pullers, most of the housemaids were from Kalahandi. In absolute uh, poor condition, they used to land up there. They used to wear these kapta saris, you know, these kind of saris, uh, which were short in length and width. And when they wore it in their own style, you could see the, the one anchel here and the other anchel at the back. There were two anchels in these sarees. Do you see this sari on the right side? That is the original Kapta sari. I took this picture. I had pictured it in the Weaver Service Center in Bhuvaneshwar. And look at the fish motifs. This, these are very old sarees. Look at the fish motifs. They are so modern. They are so 
abstract looking. They had double anchor. The sari had double anchor. It was 3.5 meters long. That is the original Kapta Habaspuri. Uh, it became extinct because weavers migrated, people migrated, and uh, some people together have now revived uh, weaving Havaspuri saris in the nearby district of Chenchigoda, but they are not weaving cotton, they are weaving silk. The sari that I am wearing here is uh, woven, is revived with the efforts of Weaver Service Center in Bhubaneswar, and they are woven in Nuapatna. So if somebody tells you this is woven by the tribals of Kalahandi, the tribals of Habaspur, please don't believe, you know, these are marketing gimmicks and, and they take away a lot from uh, these sarees. So these are revived sarees woven in uh, Nuapatna, Jagasingpur, and also in a place called Khurda in the nearby district. And I feel, uh, I feel good that they are reviving. They must stick to the original uh, designs they should not make a mishmash of all kinds of motifs from all clusters. And Nuapatna weavers are genius. They can weave anything. You know, I, I don't want to go back to the slide of Nuapatna, but they can weave anything. And they have revived many lost weaves of Orissa. This, this weave also falls into the category of tribal influence weave and not woven by tribals, we must remember. When, they, when the sellers add an additional price to it by calling it woven by tribal, I think it's very unfair to the people who are weaving it. Dongria uh, saris and Dongria shawls. This is the only weave that I am showing does not have um, GI tag yet. Why? There is a controversy around this beautiful weave. Uh, the Dongrias are the tribals. Uh, of Niamgiri and Dongria women make these shawls uh, with these motifs. They are hand embroidered. They are not woven. These motifs, they represent Niamgiri mountains. Niamgiri mountains are everything for them. They, it is their God. It gives them livelihood. They live there. It's a small community which lives, uh, the Kondha tribes of Nyamgiri, they live there. In fact, uh, there was a big movement and they did not let a huge mining company called Vedanta to start their work. Government had to stop the project. They did not want uh, their uh, mountains uh, to be, uh, you know, mined uh, because it's everything for them. And their protest worked and they succeeded. So they lived there. These women make these beautiful shawls. So that the design, the motifs don't die, uh, people in Nuapatna were inspired to use the same motif and they use the same colors. And the sari that I am wearing is woven in Nuapatna, is woven in Kurda in that uh, area. And uh, uh, um, so, okay. will people be able to see uh, the maps that I have put, little maps in the corner? They are getting to see it. Okay. So, uh, this is uh, also Kalahandi. This is also Kalahandi. So, you can imagine that these Kund, uh, these Kund tribes were already suffering from starvation and deaths and uh, they have not appreciated at all when the seller started saying that these saris are woven by uh, the Kond tribes of uh, Nyamgiri because the proceeds, the profits of these saris don't go to them because they are not the weavers. So the NGOs working there have taken a big objection to calling these saris being woven. So therefore we must know, we need to be responsible. I have tried through my post to, to tell people that these are not woven by Dungriya Kuns. Only the shawl is woven by them. And uh, therefore, even though the sari is so beautiful and Odessa government has been trying to get a GI tag, it has yet not got a GI tag. And this is also one of my favorite saris influenced by tribal life. And this is my most favorite sari, the Barampuri, because of its simplicity, because of the quality of silk used in it, 
this sari was also almost extinct, uh, but now there is a huge demand for it. Um, this sari is woven uh, in Barampur. Uh, this used to be given in the dowry. This is called Barampur Patto. Patto is a special sari, uh, silk sari, special silk sari, which used to be given in dowry. And Jagannath, Balabhadra, and Subhadra wear it as the lower garment of their, their Angavastra comes from Umapatna and their dhoti and chadar also, you know, comes from uh, Barampur. So this weave for many years only survived as the dhoti and chadar cluster. The weavers had looms designed to weave only dhoti and chadar. There used to be two pieces joined together and it was woven for uh, Jagannath and slowly the Uriya men while doing their daily puja started wearing this dhoti and chadar. Uh, I have not seen, I had not seen then, uh, I used to visit Orissa very often, any of my aunt, my cousins or anybody wearing Barampuri. Dressed with Barampuri, uh, my dress with Barampuri is very interesting. Around uh, 76, I was in uh, Utkalika Emporium, I had gone to buy something, and the handloom commissioner of Odessa, one gentleman called Mr. Ramachandran, came with um, 13 pieces of this lacquer color barampuri that you see on the left side. And uh, left behind, I, I knew his daughter, so I got talking to him. He told me that Pupul Jaikar got this woven using natural dye. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi went to attend. Uh, Science Congress to uh, Orissa. And that's where I think stones were, you know, if you remember that incident, she was hurt also. During that visit, she was gifted two pieces of this Barampuri, which was specially revived and woven for her. And uh, so they left behind this sari in the emporium. And um, it looked so simple to me. I was very young. I couldn't see what's so great about this sari at that point of time. So right in front of me, because I think the sales girl also who was there must have thought like me, what's the big deal in this sari? Let me, uh, you know, make one of the mannequins wear it. She did it right then. And the very next day, I believe uh, there was a phone call from Cottage Industry that some wonderful sarees have come. We want to buy off everything. So while disposing all the sarees, this friend of mine, so that sales girl, she called me, she said, Vijaya, it looks like it's some special sari. Uh, I'm keeping one piece for you, buy it. 500 rupees then was a huge sum for me because my salary was in ICCR, just 1100 rupees those days. So the, uh, the manager knew I was from Orissa. I bought this sari literally in installment. It is a prized position. It is the most precious sari with me. People, after I post it, people have tried to recreate this color. They can't recreate this color. Interestingly, Mrs. Gandhi wore this on the seven, uh, in 1977 on Republic Day. While I was checking, we were making a documentary. Uh, I found uh, that recording of 77 Republic Day where she was wearing this sari. So I, I really, uh, it's a treasure with me. I wear it once in a while for my uh, series. I had photographed it, worn and photographed it. Look at the border, look at the, the, the subtlety of this sari. Now, of course, uh, this sari is very popular and uh, it's being woven, though still Emporium, you will not find it in shops and Emporiums much. Um, online sellers are procuring and selling it. The only thing I feel sad, they're making huge long palla, they are adding Gopalpur motives, they are adding Barampur motives, they are making it khachpach of everything, which I really, really don't appreciate. The, the beauty of this sari is its simplicity. It's really power dressing. These kind of sarees I consider as absolute power dressing. And this is one of the most beautiful weave close to my heart. 200 year old weave worn by Jagannath. I just love it. The last slide of mine, this is also uh, GI tag, the Dhola Pathara weave. 
Dwarapathara is a cluster close to Katak uh, again. Um, they did tapestry weave. There was a time when this was a prosperous cluster and they wore uh, saris for wedding. They used to be given in dowry. But sadly, when the mills happened, uh, people started wearing mill-made saris. There was some sort of an impact on, on, on the kind of saris they were weaving. And most of the weavers from Dharapatra migrated to Surat and to Bombay mills. And uh, whoever was left behind, somehow to manage their life, they started weaving these pardas. Do you see in the center, these are curtains. These are curtains and uh, these motifs are woven using the tapestry weave. They're just like, you know, uh, what is being used in Gopalpur uh, these days. But these were pardas. Every Odia household used to have these curtains. And slowly, uh, people stopped using them as curtains also. Uh, I think Panipat curtains uh, looked more glamorous to people. Very few people are still using these curtains. So some mm, people have uh, now tried to revive these motifs on saris. They are simple cotton saris with these motifs. I have a few of them. Um, you see this uh, lion tiger motif on my sari. It is so, so fabulously woven. So it is being revived and I hope uh, uh, people buy these. They're not expensive saris, they're cotton saris. And uh, I hope this weave thrives, you know, this tapestry weave thrives. People learn it, the younger generation learns it. I believe the young boys and girls, or the boys, the weavers are not ready to learn it. They say, Koi humse shaati nahi karega. You know, that is the sad thing. But the cluster has GI tag and people have started uh, weaving it. I, I hope with GI tag, it will be protected. So this was my last uh, slide. And um, this, is, uh, this is, this was my journey. Whatever I have told you, I have learned uh, from weavers. I have learned from salesmen. I have learned from somebody who knew more than me, uh, my, my colleagues or my seniors, my father being the biggest influence. We had all the dharapathara curtains in our house and uh, he would tell me stories about Odisha's weave and weavers. He told me they were mathematicians. He was a mathematician himself. So he said the Ikat weavers were mathematicians, no less than mathematicians who had to, they had to precisely color the thread and precisely weave it. So I shared my own journey of learning it. And I always felt as a broadcaster that I must, uh, I must, I'm, uh, I'm st uh, stopping sharing now. Uh, okay, so we are uh, back together. I think it was, it went very long, but though I tried very hard uh, to be short. Um, so uh, this was my journey as a broadcaster when I started writing about it and I felt people wanted to learn, people wanted to know my, uh, my simple post uh, used to be flooded with uh, appreciative comments and long comments, you know, I felt so obliged to those people that I must write more and more and more and more about it. I also, you know, write about Kosa and Chanderi, the Chhattisgarh weaves. But Odessa weaves are something else. You know, there are so many clusters, so many different kinds of things, so many stories. Um, it's the life. The entire life of Odessa is woven on the saris. You, you see, this is what, when I say curvilinear, this is what is the curvilinear. When first time, Konark Chakra was woven uh, in uh, in uh, in Sambalpur, it was woven uh, by Dayalu Meher's father, and the name is not coming to my mind, when he woke the Kaunart Chakra. That was the ultimate of uh, curvilinear Ika. So I'll uh, stop my presentation uh, here. That was uh, so lovely. Uh, you know, I know that you said that you can't share all the clusters, but you <laughs> share one with us. And uh, I think like me, everyone else was trying to see whether they can spot a favorite sari, but it was too difficult because each page brought a new uh, 
pattern and a new weave. But I think what's more important is uh, that you taught us how to appreciate that pattern and weave. And we saw how beautifully you, you know, picked up the, for instance, the the fish and the fish bone and how it was reproduced the same pattern in the sari that you got uh, uh, the weaver to make. Uh, I think it was just eye opening in terms of not just seeing what you were wearing, but for us to appreciate our own clothes and see, uh, you know, the patterns and the weaves and uh, literally set up on a learning journey. Uh, the chat, of course, I'm not even looking at. It's filled with compliments with people, I think, who are uh, sort of amazed at the patterns um, uh, and amazed at uh, the information that you have and how beautifully you put it together. I saw the last uh, uh, tiger leopard and I'm reminded of the Vagoba in, uh, in the Varli design which is also you know, in the Varli temple, they worship the Vagoba temple has, it's a, it could be a lion or a leopard, depending on the way that, uh, you, so there is so much, um, uh, maybe the influence between the tribal designs, and yet each one of them, uh, you know, so distinct and, um, and separate. The Varli, Sora, and the Muria motifs of Chhattisgarh, to a hmm. common man, to a layman, they look almost the same. Only right. thing is Varli, uh, artists use triangles. Triangles. Figures. The Muryas and uh, the Sauras, they just, they're not so precise. Right. Yeah. It's, so, they, you know, you, you can see the similarities, but you can also see, uh, you know, when you point out uh, uh, to look at the differences and the nuances of, uh, yeah. you know, the, 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 the weave and so on. So, thank you so much. No, I, I did want to know what next and you know uh, how do we all uh, go on from here and are you planning a lot of people want to know if you're planning to uh, publish a book with all this information that you have so if you could just spend a minute and tell us what do you plan to do going forward i i don't i don't plan to come <laughs> up with a book as i told right in the beginning i and today i posted a story also i was always a communicator I am a communicator now also. I like sharing knowledge. I learned it from my father who shared his knowledge always, you know. So I do it. It's a passion to share whatever I know. I'm not a writer and I know about it. I'm a broadcaster. I, to be very honest, I never wrote my scripts when I went before the microphone. I could go on talking for hours without a script. So I'm really not a writer. First time I started writing when I writing on social media. And I only wrote my, if somebody has worked in government, you know how important the file notings are. My file notings used to be very precise. And that is where my seniors complimented. But I never really wrote, never did creative writing, especially in English. I never did creative writing. So I write as a hobby. Many uh, ask me to publish a book, but I don't want to do a shoddy job. You know, I, 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 you know, I work very hard as a broadcaster. Um, to near perfection, I spent my 35 years. So if a book has to come out, it has to be good. At 67, uh, I really at this point don't feel that I can come out with a book. Something may change, I don't know. But I will always be a media person. Right now I am on Instagram. Right now this is the thing. Uh, things may change. There may be a new media. From old media, I made a shift to new media. And I literally hobnob with youngsters. Um, I have learned, though I am still digitally, you know, uh, I, I really find it difficult sometimes. So I keep learning from my children the technology. Uh, I try to keep myself updated with technology, but like the, my hotspot got disconnected and I was completely <laughs> at a loss. But I learned it, you know, my daughter-in-law came and said it right for me. So I will always be in media. I would, uh, whatever is going to be the new uh, form of media after this, I would try to share my knowledge. Uh, but book, as of now, I can't say if I'll do. I don't know. My daughter is an art historian, art conservator. If she completes a PhD and if I am still alert enough, uh, she's doing a PhD. And if she decides to collate all this, I might do it or it may never happen. But I've created a guide. Uh, I keep creating guides in my Instagram page. Uh, so people who want to read, it reads just like a book. You can go to my guide and read about Kosa, read about Kuresa Weaves, read about Chanderi, whatever I know. 
I have shared. Uh, share, I, us, uh, share your Instagram handle with us. And uh, simple handle. My name is okay. uh, Lakshmi with L A X M I. B I J A I A L A X M I C W H A B R A. It's a simple handle. And uh, I'll continue writing uh, not only uh, about Weave. Uh, another thing that I do is I do 15 minutes storytelling of the Indian classics from regional language, the novels that I have liked over the years, or the stories um, of my growing up years. It's a challenge. It's a challenge to speak for 15 minutes nonstop without fumbling, without repeating the thought. Uh, so I, I love doing those videos. So there are those videos. So I keep inventing and reinventing whatever I can do. That's my, that's the way forward. That's lovely. That's so inspiring, not just, uh, uh, you know, the Orissa and its weaves, but also the way you are learning. And uh, I hope that all of us uh, will be inspired and do new things uh, in a similar fashion. Thank you so much, everyone. There are a lot of compliments on, on the chat. Everyone has complimented, but because we're short of time, I uh, am not going to run through all of them. Uh, a lot of people have thanked you for your, uh, not just the information, but also your passion and uh, commitment. So um, thank you so much. There are people from the place who said from uh, Jagat Singhpur and have learned a lot from you and, and so on. Lots of compliments. But in, because we're short of time, I'm not going to go through all of them. But thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you over here this Saturday evening and see you all next week again. Thank you.